for the keynote address for our ninth annual PeaceWorks, yet again as captives. I'm Becca Pilcher, Secretary of the Board of Directors for the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. The PeaceWorks mission states that no matter what form the event may take, it must provide a forum for exploring the meaning and practice of justice and peace as they affect the social, economic, political, environmental, and spiritual aspects of people's lives. We proceed with the understanding that all people share not only human rights, aspirations, and needs, but also the foibles of fear, aggression, and domination. With this in mind, we encourage PeaceWorks participants to explore their own hearts first as they connect to the world community. Striving for fundamental social change and a just society, we focus on individuals and groups who work on local, national, and global levels to resist oppression, inequality, and war. We explore racism, poverty, global economic inequality, oppression of women, and other forms of injustice. In doing so, we strive to formulate and communicate a hopeful vision of a world community that responds constructively to its inhabitants' rights, aspirations, and needs. On behalf of the Foundation, I would like to thank the PeaceWorks Planning Committee, and particularly Andrew Meyer, who has led this effort from the beginning. to thank the Board of Directors and the numerous volunteers, interns, and staff members who worked tirelessly to make this event possible. Lastly, I would like to thank the Washington Center and our co-sponsors who are listed in your program. At the end of our presentations, there will be a question and answer session with the audience. You will find a three by five card in your program to write your questions on and pass to the end of your aisle for our volunteers to collect throughout the lectures. At the end of the night, our speakers will be available for a book signing in the lobby. Their time is limited, so they will only be able to sign autographs. The Rachel Corey Foundation depends on the support of our community. And if you're able to make a contribution tonight, we would be extremely grateful. Simply fill out the donation form in your program and place it in one of our collection baskets in the lobby. Please do not take any flash photos or record videos during the presentations. There will be DVDs available through the RCF's website in the coming weeks. Most importantly, please turn off your cell phones. Now, I would like to introduce Savina Chowdhury. Savina teaches feminist economics and political economy at the Evergreen State College and is a fellow board member at RCF. Savina worked with incarcerated youth at the Juvenile Detention Center last year as part of the Gateways for Incarcerated Youth program. Her book, Everyday Economic Practices, The Hidden Transcriptions of Egyptian Voices, is based on her work with the United Nations Development Program. Please help me welcome Savina. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the keynote conversation of PeaceWorks 2014. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce you to our first speaker. Noura Erika is a human rights attorney and writer. She's currently a Freedman Teaching Fellow at Temple University Beasley School of Law and is a member of the legal support for the Baudel Center for Palestinian Refugee and Residency Rights. She has taught international human rights law and the Middle East at Georgetown University since spring 2009. Most recently, she served as legal counsel for a congressional subcommittee in the House of Representatives chaired by Congressman Dennis Kucinich. She is a co-editor of Jadalia.com. She has helped to initiate and organize several national formations, including Arab Women Arising for Justice and the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. She is, she is a board member of the Institute for Policy Studies, the Trans-Arab Research Institute, a policy advisor of Al Shabaka, a founding member of the DC Palestinian Film and Arts Festival, the development consultant for Legal Agenda, and a contributor to International Law Girls. Noura has published in The Nation, Huffington Post, The Hill, Al Ahram English, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Al Shabaka, Jadalia, and The American Prospect. Please join me in welcoming Noura Erika. Wow. 
uh, that was far, far too long. Um, but what an honor uh, to be in a space filled with visionaries and organizers and tireless uh, workers. Thanks especially to Cindy and Craig Corey. I see you. Uh, Thank you to Cindy and Craig for your undying commitment to justice, for which the Rachel Corey Foundation is just one piece. I, I see the foundation as the phoenix that you willed into existence from the ashes of an unnecessary and, and cruel loss. So thank you very much. Um, in giving thanks, I also want to thank Andrew Meyer for all of his work, for you and your team and another stalwart generation of unapologetic organizers. Hell yes we can with organizers like you. And of course, thank you, Ms. Angela Davis, for everything that you are, for your sacrifice and your stamina, for being a living example of what the system tries to destroy but cannot. You have been connecting these transnational dots of race, class, and gender well before I even knew what dots were. <laughs> I am honored and humbled to be having this conversation here with you, but let's be real, I'm mostly nervous and really grateful. <laughs> so why this conversation? Since 1967, Israel has incarcerated 800,000 Palestinians, no less than 20% of the Palestinian population limited to the occupied West Bank and Gaza. Today, in captivity, there are 5,224 Palestinians, including 21 women, 83 administrative detainees, and 210 children, 34 of whom are under the age of 16. And notably, Israel considers Palestinian children to be those under, uh, under the, that Palestinian children can include those up to the age of 18, unlike the application of its own laws to its Israeli uh, children. Among Palestinians, jail is a very normalized part of life, as normal and as common as school, as babies, as olive oil and time. There is no stigma to it, because the crimes for which Palestinians are locked up in cold, distant cells are crimes of resistance. Resistance to oppression, to subjugation, to humiliation, and the degradation of land and family. To Palestinians, they are all political prisoners. And they are prisoners for whom we sing songs. Min sijin akka, tulad janazi, Muhammad jamjum u fuad hjazi. Jazi alayhum ya sha'b jazi. The funeral procession set out from Akka prison for Muhammad Jamjum and Fuad Hijazi. Oh, how they punish them, my people. Oh, how the High Commissioner and his people punish them. This is a chorus for a song dedicated to three Palestinian martyrs resisting British and Zionist colonial. Uh, domination in the 1930s. It's a gruesome story that's been romanticized and encapsulates the Palestinian condition. Palestinians know that the criminal system is an unjust system, and we must know that too. We cannot take the criminal system at face value. Our prisons, from Palestine to Saudi Arabia, to China and the United States are not filled with bad people who have done bad things. Criminal law, more than any other type of law, represents, represents the moral compass of society. And rather than punishing what causes the greatest harm to society, it punishes what society considers the most important. That's why. Across 14 states, including Texas, Idaho, Oklahoma, and Virginia, sodomy was illegal until 2003. And meanwhile, in California, same-sex marriage became legal as early as 2008. 
That's why in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you can walk around and smoke a joint publicly. But in Louisiana, you can be imprisoned for up to 20 years for mere possession of marijuana. Criminal law does not represent what will harm us most. Criminal law represents what is the greatest risk to those in power. And for Palestinians, those in power represent an ethos of settler colonialism. Upon its establishment, Israel passed a series of laws that privileged its Jewish inhabitants and further dispossessed and marginalized its non-Jewish, indigenous, Christian, and Palestinian population. The Citizenship Law of 1952 and the Law of Return of 1950 ensured that Jewish persons who lived beyond Israel's boundaries and had no relationship to it had more rights than the state's own Palestinian citizens. The new state was cementing its Jewish demographic majority that its Zionist founders thought necessary to preserve Israel's Jewish character. By instituting a series of similar laws, it also preserved Jewish political, social, and economic privilege. The purpose of these laws has been to ensure that Palestinians are a minority, an underclass, and a fragmented population within its society. Israel's policies aim to diminish the Palestinian population, to geographically concentrate them into separated ghettos, and to erase their presence physically and metaphysically in an effort to uphold a national mythology regarding its establishment and existence. Between 1948 and 1966, Israel imposed emergency laws within its non-declared borders. Israel has never declared its borders to this day. That's why saying the 1967 borders is so uh, blasphemous. So it's non-declared borders. And it imposed emergency law upon its Arab citizens, the 100,000 Palestinians who didn't flee in the course of Plan Dalit or the 1948 war, the, ne the Palestinian Nakba, the Palestinian population who now constitute approximately 1.3 million of Israel's population, or 20% of its population, not including those in the West Bank and Gaza. It imposed this emergency law, which is the law that allows a government to conduct itself by force rather than consent. It imposed it upon its non-Jewish citizens only up until 1966 because it prepared for the imposition of that law upon the Palestinian population in the occupied territories in 1967 to this present day. This emergency law is derivative of a British colonial administration. Historically, the British Empire applied emergency law to suppress rebellion and self-determination amongst native peoples from Kenya to Malaya to British Guyana and Mandate Palestine. And while other countries like Egypt and Syria have applied emergency law for decades, the moniker for the longest lasting imposition of this law goes to the only democracy in the Middle East. A matrix of 1,500 military laws exist in the occupied territories. They can be changed arbitrarily without notice, applied retroactively in violation of the most basic tenet of criminal law, nulen crimen sin lege, or no crime and no punishment where there was no applicable law prohibiting it. But this does not matter to Israel, where the laws decide to further settler colonial expansion. Thus, it is illegal for Palestinians to drive on Israeli-only roads. It is illegal to build homes without permits that are systematically denied. It is illegal to commemorate the Nakba within Israel. It is illegal to build ties with Palestinians and Arab throughout the surrounding Middle East and Arab world, as was just the case with 23-year-old journalist Majid Kayali, who has been charged with treason, treason, given a gag order, and now held under house arrest. It is illegal 
for Palestinians from Gaza to study at Birzeit University, Najaf University, Abu Dis University in the West Bank because of an infiltrator's law. It is illegal to go fishing beyond three nautical miles off of the Gaza coast where fishermen would fish to feed their families and to have a livelihood in contravention, contravention of basic human rights as well as the 2012 ceasefire agreement. It is illegal for Palestinian citizens of Israel to marry a Palestinian from so-called enemy states, and including the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, um, and to live, to acquire a residency for them in their homes of Haifa, Yaffa, Akka, Safa, Bisad, Tarshiha, Umm al Fahm, and the rest of Israel and its non-declared borders. It is illegal to worship as a Muslim in the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem if you are not among the few who have Jerusalemite ID or Israeli citizenship. It is illegal to reach the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem as Palestinian Christians have been denied that right this weekend, this Easter, as, uh, in, and the last nine Easter's and in every day of their lives this year and in the indefinite years to come. Given Israel's desire to control the most land with the least Palestinians, together with its arbitrary matrix of military and discriminatory law, the question is not why so many Palestinians, 800,000 since 1967, have built, been held in capti captivity, but why so many have not? And the truth is, is that they are all held in captivity being denied self-determination and the right to choose freely one's own economic, cultural, social, and political future is being held in captivity, whether in the open-air prison on the Gaza Strip, whether in forced exile throughout the 58 refugee camps in the Arab world and in the global diaspora, or whether as impediments to Israel's hegemony the world over. Israeli prison cells are simply one and amongst the most visceral of this multi-layered captivity. In the US, where settler colonialism is ongoing and where we have yet to mourn the institution of slavery as a nation and to issue even monetary, nominal monetary reparations for those crimes against humanity, our criminal system is no different. Our laws criminalize poverty, and our police forces disproportionately patrol communities of color. Of course, communities of color will be disproportionately represented in prisons when that's where we place our police. Of course, Muslims and Arabs will be subject to FBI investigations of terrorism when that's who the FBI targets. Over the last 30 years, the US penal population has risen from approximately 300,000 to over 2 million, the majority of which consists of drug convictions. Three fourths of all people imprisoned for drug offenses are black and Latino, despite the majority of drug users and dealers being white. Native Americans only constitute 1.2% of the U.S.'s population, and yet are incarcerated at a rate of 38% greater than the national average. In 2010, African Americans who are systematically excluded from the former labor market had the highest poverty rate in over half a century. 27.4% of African Americans made less than $11,139 a year. That is criminal. And yet, one out of every 15 African American males is locked up in prison in comparison to one out of every 106 white Americans. And this, by the way, is to say nothing of the way that we criminalize our immigrant population who suffer both for economic and national vulnerability. But the, but these laws do not simply punish certain populations, 
they dehumanize them. In February 2012, a young unarmed boy was fatally gunned down. In July 2013, a jury acquitted his shooter, citing that he had the right to self-defense. The judgment makes no sense. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was unarmed, save for a bag of Skittles. Its most deadly ingredient was its high fructose corn syrup. But the jury agreed that George Zimmerman experienced reasonable fear at the sight of a black child in a hoodie. A reasonable enough fear to use a lethal weapon to fatally shoot this boy at close proximity. And in this tragedy, we learned again, and we're reminded again, that self-defense doesn't belong to everybody. That the right to victimhood is an exclusive right that doesn't belong to everybody. Last summer, I co-led an interfaith peace builders delegation. You should all join one. Where we met David Wilder, head of the Hebron Settlement Council and a US-born Jewish man from Cleveland. Hebron, if you don't know, in Khalil, is the site of the most extreme forms of tangible violence. The settler movement began to colonize it in 1967 in what they regard as their homecoming. They're ideologically motivated and are more committed to being on the land which they, belong, which they believe belongs to them by defying decree than they are to the state of Israel. And unlike other settlements which are built on hilltops, so that settlers in the army can surveil Palestinians. In Hebron, the settlement is built straight in the middle of the Palestinian community, creating a donut hole, terrorizing the Palestinians who live there. In response to a question about Baruch Goldstein, the Israeli settler who killed 29 Palestinians as they prayed at the Ibrahimi Mosque in 1994, David explained, quote, you can count on one or two hands the Jews who have used violence that was not in self-defense. In contrast, Isa Amro, a Palestinian youth leader of youth against settlements like all other Palestinians, does not have a state, does not have an international force, does not have an army, does not have weapon, does not have anyone to protect him. Settlers physically assault, spit on, and expose themselves to Isa Amro and children in Palestinians in Al Khalid as Israeli soldiers watch on. The army does intervene, but only if Palestinians react in any way. Then the soldiers detain the Palestinians and not the settlers. Isa explains, quote, I am nonviolent. I am a nonviolent activist, but I believe in defending myself. The problem is that I cannot. Isa is not eligible to experience reasonable fear. He will never be able to exercise self-defense under the current matrix of law. He is always the looming threat. Amongst Americans, and certainly those in the Beltway, where um, I've lived, unfortunately, for a long time, this couldn't be farther from the truth. Excuse me for one second. continue with what I know. Uh, unfortunately, I know quite a bit on this, uh, having seen it and lived it. Let me tell you a little bit more about the conditions of settler violence, which is not prosecuted. Settlers, uh, there's an average of one attack by settlers on Palestinians every day. In 2013, there were 399 attacks. In November, on November 14, 2013, in one attack, in one of the most gruesome attacks, at 2 a.m., 
two settler men approached the home of Ruayda and Khalid Dar Khalil, where they slept with their five children. The settler men poured gasoline onto the porch and threw a Molotov cocktail through the window. They firebombed the home. The fire blocked the door and the entire family had to rush to the rooftop to obtain shelter. They survived as the Palestinian fire department did come, but those settler men have never been prosecuted for that crime. And in fact, that's the norm. In the past 10 years, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel documented 700 complaints by Palestinians about settler violence. And of those 700 complaints, 700 went without a criminal investigation. There is impunity that's afforded by the state for these settlers to attack. And in fact, soldiers stand idly by until Palestinians attack, and then they are incarcerated. But Israeli troops don't even need a reason to incarcerate Palestinians. Under the military law I spoke of, Israel can arbitrarily detain Palestinians, imprison them for up to six months without charge or trial, renewable every six months indefinitely. Imagine the denial of habeas corpus that we protested vehemently in Guantanamo Bay. Imagine that that's applied to Palestinians for over 60 years. In the case of Yed Zin, he has been in prison for up to five, nearly five years now. His sentence renewed 30 times. 183 Palestinians are in administrative detention today. And the reason they're detained without charge or trial is not because they've done something wrong, but because they become subjects of interrogation. Interrogation where Israel practices torture systematically. Since 1967, Israel has tortured to death 73 Palestinians in its custody. The most recent among these was Arafat Jaradat, a 30-year-old man who wasn't incarcerated for more than 70 days before he died as a result of torture. Israel doesn't even bother to use the euphemism, uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. It says we torture in the name of national security, and national security specifically for its Jewish citizens. And after 66 years of ongoing Israeli subjugation, the risk of accepting these conditions as natural is severely high. Doing so would accept Israel's national security narrative and reify the absurd human rights atrocities that plague Palestinians in particular and all of humanity in general. But Palestinians have not waited for anyone to save them. Palestinian political prisoners in April 2012 used the one thing they had at their disposal to resist this condition. They used their own bodies in a massive hunger strike. On April 17, 2012, 2,500 Palestinian political prisoners engaged in a massive hunger strike. They asked for the most basic things, the right to a higher education, the right to medical care, the right to family visits, the right to purchase items from canteen, the right to uh, know what the charges against them were, or to be released. Fa'ir Halahle was one of these hunger strikers. He got, on his 73rd day of his hunger strike, his, glove, his gums and his lips were bleeding. He reached 121 pounds. Four days later, the Israeli prison authorities let him out. But during his captivity, he wrote a letter to his one-year-old daughter who he had not met yet. And he wrote, my beloved Lama, forgive me because the occupation took me away from you and from the pleasure of witnessing my firstborn child that I have always prayed to God to see, to kiss, to be happy with. It is not your fault. This is our destiny as Palestinian people to have our lives and the lives of our children taken away from us. Lama, my love, that day will come when I am free, and I will make it up to you for everything, and tell you the whole story, and your days that will follow will be more beautiful. 
So let your days pass now and wear your prettiest clothes. Run and then run again in the gardens of your long life. Go forward and forward for nothing is behind you but the past. And this is your voice I hear all the time as a melody of freedom. Israel, we arrested that in. I'll clap for him as well. Yeah. Israeli officials were arrested Fahed on April 10, 2013. This is his eighth time in prison. He spent six and a half years now in captivity, not a single charge filed against him. But this is common practice. For all the talk that we've been hearing about prisoner release in this current peace process, Israel can release and re-arrest Palestinians at will. That's what an occupying force can do. That's what an apartheid regime can do. Palestinians can't arrest a single Israeli, certainly can't arrest the settlers that attack them, certainly can't protect themselves against those who harm them. Between, since 1967 and 2000, 1993 and 2013, so between the start of the peace process and last year, Israel released about 26,000 Palestinian political prisoners as a gesture of goodwill, and has rearrested 86,000 in that same period. Palestinians will com continue to resist, as they have resisted and as they have inspired us. But the truth is, even when they're released from their cold, distant, concrete prison cells, released back into their homes in Ramallah and Nablus, in Gaza City, and Rafah, they are still not free. Pal no Palestinian will be free until the entirety of this apartheid regime is dismantled. And Palestinians are certainly committed to this, and I've asked you all to commit with them as well in their 2005 call for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israeli apartheid colonialism and settler, uh, settler colonialism and occupation. And most relevant to this discussion is the target of G4S, a private security company that profits off of the incarceration of every additional person, from Palestine to Australia to Brazil and beyond. G4S, will our bodies are their bottom line. And so the campaign now is against them. And only two days ago, the Boycott National Committee has asked, especially those in the United States, especially you, to press on the, Melinda, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which owns $170 million worth of stock in G4S to divest their holdings, to divest those holdings. So I urge you all to join that, to answer that call, to join that campaign, to sing along to the melody of Fa'ed's daughter, Lamar. I urge you all to voice, to, to raise your voices in freedom. Let's free all of our political prisoners at home. Let's free ourselves from corporate greed and domination. Let's free our people who should have never been lock, locked up. And let's free, free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep talking. I'm up here to introduce the, uh, the one and only Miss Angela Davis, who are all waiting in anticipation to hear. That was the hardest talk to give because I knew I wanted to get through it so I can hear you. <laughs> through her activism and scholarship over many decades, Angela Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice around the world. 
Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Mm -hmm. Angela is now Distinguished Professor Emerita of History of Consciousness, an interdisciplinary PhD program, and a feminist studies. She is the author of nine books and has lectured throughout the United States as well as in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America. She draws upon her own experiences in the early 70s as a person who spent 18 months in jail and on trial after being placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Her recent books include Abolition Democracy and Are Prisons Obsolete? In 2012, she published a new collection of essays entitled The Meaning of Freedom. Angela Davis is the founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to the dismantling of the prison industrial complex. Internationally, she is affiliated with Sisters Inside, an abolitionist organization based in Queensland, Australia, that works in solidarity with women in prison. Please help me welcome Ms. Angela Davis. to participate in uh, the Rachel Corey <coughs> Foundation 2014 PeaceWorks Conference. And I'm going to reiterate the theme yet again as captives, mass incarceration in the US and Palestine. And let me say that um, for many years I have been inspired by the courage of Rachel Corey. I have followed the work of Cindy and Craig Corey and have been inspired by their determination to engage in and promote the kind of grassroots and arts <coughs> activism that will engrave the memory of Rachel Corey on the hearts of people all over the world. I have spoken numerous times about Rachel Corey, including several times at Evergreen State uh, here in Olympia. Um, but this is certainly one of the high points of my political trajectory, to be able to be here with the Rachel Corey Foundation and engage in a discussion <laughs> about an issue which has claimed my passion and my activism for more than a half century. So let me thank Cindy and Craig Corey, the Rachel Corey Foundation, and all of the people involved in sponsoring this amazing conference. Uh, and also let me thank um, Sabina um, Chowdhury, who's the, who will be moderating the <laughs> conversation shortly. But before I begin, I have to apologize um, that I caught a cold last week because I didn't get enough sleep. And uh, uh, I, have, I have my tea with me, I have tissues, and so I want to apolo apologize in advance if there are any um, uh, coughing interludes. Uh, uh, and that will only be because I have reached the point where I can no longer hold the cough in, so you should understand that. <laughs> but let me say that this kind of gathering, this conference, this theme, is precisely what we need at this moment to make it possible for progressive people in this country to seriously talk about and act against the occupation of Palestine 
and to place the carceral practices of the state of Israel within the context of the global prison industrial complex, which means that when we talk about mass incarceration in the US, we need to be able to explore the connections with the mass political incarceration of Palestinians by the state of Israel. And I think this is especially important given the fact that Palestinian Prisoners uh, Day was, what, two days ago, right? Um, I think this is a moment when it is possible in this country to generate increasing support for BDS. Right now, at this very moment, the Asian American Studies Association is meeting in San Francisco. And if you did not know, they were the first academic association to pass a resolution calling for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. as many of you know, by the American Studies Association. And those of us who are, well, I'm a member of ASA and work toward uh, the passage of the, res uh, the resolution in the ASA, but many of us who are members of other academic professional organizations are hard at work attempting to guarantee that this will become a trend. I am really sorry that I wasn't able to attend um, the, the workshops. Uh, I, um, I was speaking at Pacific University last night uh, because I had come to Washington back in February, come, no, Oregon. Oregon and Washington. It's like, I, I, I live in California. Anything north of the California border, it gets kind of conflated into one state. But I was, I was in, um, I was in, um, you know, Forest Grove, which is uh, near Portland. Uh, in February, I came here to speak, and and you had this amazing blizzard in the, uh, in this area, and so I ended up spending three hours on the interstate um, driving to the university, at which point I discovered the university was closed, <laughs> and turned around and spent five hours getting back to the airport that evening, so anyway. So that's why I was uh, in Forest Grove, uh, Oregon last night. And I was not uh, able to hear the, the workshops uh, from looking at the, the titles of the workshops and the descriptions. They, were, they must have been um, really fascinating and insightful. Um, um, political prisoners, of course, but I see that there was a workshop on the school to prison pipeline, on immigrant detention, and of course, uh, immigrant detention is the most profitable sector of the, what we call the prison industrial complex, uh, not only here, but in other parts of the world as well. Um, solitary confinement, prisoner hunger strikes from Palestine to Pelican Bay, uh, when, I, when I looked at the description of, of, of all of the, the workshops, it struck me that somehow uh, we need to pass this on as a model to people in other parts of the country so that they can hold conferences and meetings that explore these connections. We can no longer afford to treat the use of carceral strategies by the state of Israel and the use of carceral strategies by the United States as entirely unrelated issues. At the same time that we acknowledge the contextual differences, we need to point out that the same technologies are employed 
and that in many instances, the same corporations profit from the sale of these technologies to the two governments. More generally, of course, we know that if it were not for the aid provided by the US to the tune of some $3 billion a year, the occupation could not continue. The US provides what amounts to over one-fifth of Israel's entire military budget. So certainly, before we even begin to explore the intersections between the two countries' practices of mass incarceration, we see how deeply the US is implicated in the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Why do so many people assume that the government of Israel must be considered immune to substantive critique? And of course, it is because of the emotional connection people are urged to make between the Holocaust and Israel as the only viable haven uh, for Jews. It's often assumed that we cannot say never again without supporting Israel. But the violence that claimed the lives of so many Jews during the Holocaust is not unrelated to racist violence, to settler colonial violence in the US, in South Africa, uh, in Australia, in Europe. And it seems to me that just as we claim the right to stand up to governments all over the world, and just as we claim the right to stand up to the US government, even, and perhaps especially, the United States government of the Obama era, we should join increasing numbers of Israeli citizens, Jewish and Arab, in standing up to the state of Israel. As Nora pointed out, something like 800,000 Palestinians have been subjected to imprisonment since 1967. If we look at the United States, we can see that there are almost two and a half million people in US state and federal prisons, but we add to the prisons also the county jails and the military prisons at the jails in Indian country, and also the immigrant detention centers. <laughs> Michelle Alexander has um, pointed out that there are more black men in prison and under the direct control of correctional agencies today, in the second decade of the 21st century, than there were enslaved in 1850. Now that's a pretty, you know, sometimes statistics uh, are, you know, can be manipulated and they're confusing and people, uh, you know, do all kinds of weird things with statistics. Uh, uh, and at the same time, it's often assumed that that's the only real knowledge that there is. Uh, and I think we use the statistics, but we also point out that the knowledge comes from elsewhere. Uh, but that's a pretty dramatic uh, um, contrast, isn't it? I'm really very happy that the organizers of this conference decided to explore the connections between mass incarceration in Palestine and mass incarceration in the US. And I realize every time I um, speak the way I normally speak, which is um, raising my voice a little bit more, it feels like it's going to disappear. <laughs> so 
I'm, you, you, my volume may change inexplicably. <laughs> In the U.S., of course, here in this country, we tend to separate political prisoners from the vast numbers of prisoners whose bodies constitute fuel for profit for the prison industrial complex. I can tell you that many years ago, when, when I was arrested, and that was before a lot of you were born, <laughs> It was in 1970. What we attempted to do was to trouble that what appeared to be a distinction that was too clear between political prisoners and criminals, right? Of course, I was considered a political prisoner, even though I was arrested on three criminal charges. I was charged with murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy, all of which were capital charges at the time. So I was charged with the death penalty three times, you know, which is really bizarre that uh, they think they can uh, send you to, uh, what was at that time, the gas chamber three times. But at that time, there were many other political prisoners, uh, some of whose names you may recognize. Uh, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, Erica Huggins, other members of the Black Panther Party, young people who were involved in Latino organizations such as the Young Lords or the Brown Berets. There was a campaign on the West Coast, for example, around Los Siete de la Raza. And I should point out that there are people who are still in prison from that era. As a matter of fact, my co-defendant, Rochelle McGee, observed the 50th anniversary of his imprisonment as we were observing the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and the Birmingham campaign, etc. cetera. Um, Mondo Weilanga, David Poindexter, um, Veronzo Bowers, and of course, Leonard Peltier, uh, who was one of the longest held political prisoners in this country. And then, Mumia Abu Jamal, who was arrested later, but has still spent decades of his life um, on death row before he was uh, recently uh, placed in the main population. Now, during the era of the 70s, we began to think about the connection between political prisoners, those who were arrested for um, having been involved in political acts or because of their political affiliation, the connection between political prisoners and those who were politicized while they were in prison and therefore came to be subjected to yet another level of repression. Uh, George Jackson, for example, the Soledad brothers, are, are good examples of uh, the uh, ways in which people who were considered to be criminals became politicized. Uh, and, and then thanks to uh, the ways in which prisoners like George Jackson began to um, analyze uh, the, the situation of people in prison at that time, we came to recognize that, that most people in prison were there because of the racist and political function of the criminal justice system. Uh, and of course, the the best example of the, what we might call the structural racism 
of the criminal justice system, and um, Nora already referred to that, are the racial disparities in drug arrests and drug convictions and drug sentencing. Um, and according to the NAACP, five times as many white people use drugs as black people. Yet black people are sent to prison for drug offenses at 10 times the rate of white people. And here are a couple of more statistics. African Americans represent 12% of the total population of drug users, which is about the population, the percentage of the main population. But 38% of those arrested for drug offenses and 59% of those in state prison for a drug offense. Uh, African Americans serve virtually as much time in prison for a drug offense, 58.7 months, this is the NAACP still, as whites do for a violent offense, which is 61.7 months. Now, this racial disparity represents an example of the structural racism that is a political feature that pervades the criminal justice system from the level of law enforcement to correctional agencies. So even those who are labeled political prisoners, who are not labeled political prison, prisoners, rather, are, for the most part, in prison because of a set of political conditions that are responsible for the continued existence of racist strategies and ideologies. As Frederick Douglass said many, many years ago, crime is imputed to color. Crime is imputed to color. He was referring then to the criminalization of slaves and then former slaves. Um, now, if we kind of fast forward to uh, the, the present and we think about the emergence of what we call a prison industrial complex as the consequence of the privatization of human resources and the deindustrialization of the economy and the dismantling of the welfare state, one can say that the incarceration of so many youth of color in this country is a dramatic indication of the failure of US society. Instead of encouraging young, black, Latino, Native American uh, people, this is actually true of poor youth, of all racial and national backgrounds, instead of encouraging them to dream of a democratic future, they stamp them as surplus populations. They are not needed. So there will be no schools for them. Or if there are schools, there will be schools that emphasize punishment, discipline and punishment, and testing. Testing is a part of the discipline punishment uh, uh, process. Uh, and in a sense, it seems to me, given the fact that there have been amazing examples of young people, children, um, participating in mass movements. If you look at the, the movement of the 60s in the South, uh, that was young people. And as a matter of fact, in Birmingham in 1963, there was a children's crusade where children got arrested and were, um, were attacked by Bull Connor's dogs and by high power fire hoses. Uh, and they kept coming back. Uh, um, this, was, um, this is a, a movement about which we don't uh, hear a great deal today. You think that it was Dr. King who did all of the major work to bring about a change. Uh, um, and, and I think about the fact that in occupied Palestine today, 
Children are arrested in the middle of the night and are interrogated without the presence of lawyers or parents. And it seems to me that this is an indication of the fragility of the whole of the state of Israel over the Palestinian people. Prison is a fact of life for many people. People here in the US, and especially black people, Latinos, Native and Asian American communities targeted by police, poor white people as well can identify this uh, process of criminalization. Virtually, I think probably almost every black person in this country, even someone like Clarence Thomas, uh, the ones who Martin Luther King said had climbed out of the swamps on the shoulders of their sisters and brothers and failed to look back and failed to realize how they got out of the swamp in the first place. Uh, uh, even they have direct or indirect connections to prison, a family member, a friend who has been in prison. And as I said when I spoke last year at an observance of Palestinian prisoners' day, here in the US with two and a half million people behind bars, it has never occurred to us to have a prisoner's day. I mean, I think we can learn so much from the Palestinian struggle. Of course, of course, in Palestine, virtually every prisoner in an Israeli jail is a political prisoner. And the small minority who might not be arrested for explicitly political acts quickly become political once they meet their brothers and sisters behind bars. As much as Israel would like to pretend that the occupation of Palestine is working well, the numbers of prisoners indicate that the occupation can only be managed by means of violence and repression. When I traveled to Palestine um, in the summer of 2011 with a delegation of women of color and indigenous uh, um, feminist scholar activists. It was actually the first trip for all of us. But all of us had been involved for many years in Palestine solidarity work. We were all totally shocked by the egregious and visible nature of the repression. The Israeli military made no attempt to conceal or mitigate the violence they were uh, inflicting on Palestinian people. Gun-toting military men and women were everywhere. I remember saying that uh, I was in South Africa uh, before the downfall of apartheid. I didn't violate the boycott. I was invited by the ANC uh, to come. Uh, and I also had traveled to Northern Ireland at one of the most difficult periods. And I said that um, neither place was as bad as what I witnessed uh, in occupied Palestine. <coughs> On our delegation, there were people who had grown up in South Africa, and um, people who had grown up on Indian reservations, people who had grown up in the Jim Crow South, and everybody had exactly the same uh, reaction. The wall, you know, the concrete, the razor wire, uh, as Nora said, those are the um, technologies of, uh, uh, of imprisonment that is transferred from the prison to the larger community. Um, 
We were already in prison. But of course, um, I still cannot get uh, the image of these um, young Israeli kids walking around with these huge weapons with their um, fingers on the trigger uh, all the time. It was really scary. And then, of course, in um, Hebron, uh, also walking through the marketplace and looking up and seeing an Israeli soldier with his gun aimed directly at you. So, yeah. We could not help expressing absolute shock that we had not realized that in so many respects it was worse than South African apartheid, worse than Jim Crow racism. We realized that the carceral technologies that we have seen in maximum and super maximum security prisons here in the US were very much at use in the so-called free world, which was clearly not free. Virtually everyone we met had either been in prison or had family members and friends who had been in prison. And there are many figures that are proposed uh, to, in to indicate how many Palestinians have been arrested since the occupation of the West Bank and, and Gaza began in 1967, between 750,000 and a million um, Palestinians have been arrested. 800,000 is the figure that people usually give. And that's 20% of the population. That's 40% of the male population. That is why virtually everyone has a direct connection to someone in prison or who has been in prison. And this is also why I believe Palestinians have such great respect for those behind bars. Uh, because historically, much of the leadership of the resistance has come from prison. I think we here in the US can learn a great deal from our sisters and brothers in Palestine. We can learn from their dedication, from their perseverance, from their optimism. We can learn from their belief in the power of education. Um, I was... Um, so totally impressed to learn that the literacy rate is over 90%. Even though the Israeli prison service provides only a negligible number of teachers, the prisoners themselves teach classes. And this, of course, is a long tradition from Gramsci, Mandela, etc. Education and liberation are inseparable. The Palestinians know this better than anyone else. Uh, and I think we here in the US need to relearn that lesson about the connection between education and liberation. <laughs> During the last uh, um, part of my talk, I want to um, follow what uh, Nora uh, pointed to and spend a few minutes talking about G4S, uh, because this is an important campaign. Uh, and we know that there are quite a number of transnational corporations that have been identified as targets of the boycott. Uh, uh, Veolia, for example. I don't know if you have Super Shuttle up here. You do? Okay, yeah, yeah. So don't use Super Shuttle anymore. Uh, um, and of course, uh, as a result of, who was it? Scarlett Johansson, we know about Soda, Soda Stream, right? Uh, and then there's Boeing and Hewlett Packard. And of course, there's Caterpillar because uh, Caterpillar, whose products are used by the Israeli military, we will never forget that it was a militarized Caterpillar bulldozer that took the life of Rachel Corey. 
G4S is especially important because it participates directly in the maintenance and reproduction of repressive apparatuses in Palestine. So we're talking about prisons, checkpoints, the apartheid wall. G4S represents the growing insistence on what is called security under the neoliberal state and the ideologies of security that bolster not only privatization of security, but the privatization of imprisonment and the privatization of warfare. It is responsible, G4S is responsible for the repressive treatment of political prisoners inside Israel. And of course, through Ademir, we have learned about the um, the character of the imprisonment that is faced by so many Palestinians, but also about their hunger strikes uh, and other forms of resistance. G4S is the largest security corporation in the world. It's also the third largest private corporation in the world. Third only in relation to, you know, the first one, right? What is the largest um, private corporation in the world? Walmart. Walmart. What's the second one? Foxconn. Foxconn. Absolutely right. And what's the third one? G4S. G4S has insinuated itself into our lives under the guise of security and the security state, from the way Palestinians experience political incar incarceration to racist technologies of separation and apartheid from the wall in Israel to prison-like schools in the US to the wall along the US-Mexico border. G4S brings sophisticated technologies of control to, to prisons in, in, in Israel, like Hashran prison, which includes children among its prisons, and Daman prison, which incarcerates women as well. But, but I think it's important for us to recognize that it is involved in education in the U.S. And our fairy system. As well. But yes, we can go on and on. But I was, you know, I was impressed because I, um, I was looking at a website by the name of Great Schools, because I was doing some work on education. And I came across um, a school in Florida that is called Central Pasco Girls Academy in Land Lakes, Florida. And what, what you learn is that it is a small alternative public school. But then when you look at the facilities page of the G4S website, you discover this entry. Because that school belongs to G4S. Central Pasco Girls Academy Lanza Lake, Florida, serves 32 moderate-risk females aged 13 to 18 who have been assessed as needing intensive mental health services. And so when you consider that the process of producing mental health has been given up entirely, and as a matter of fact, the two largest psychiatric institutions in this country are Cook County Jail in Chicago and Rikers Island in New York. Now, when you consider that and you realize that G4S is involved um, in, this, um, in, in this girls' school, and they indicate that they use gender-specific treatment addressing sexual abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence, trauma, and, and you know, 
if this security company is going to be responsible for addressing issues of intimate violence and substance abuse, you can be sure that those social problems will be with us forever. <laughs> because they're about reproducing them. In the UK, I learned that G4S operates rape crisis centers. Now, this is a security corporation, a corporation that owns and operates prisons all over, all over the country, a corporation that provides transportations, you know, talking about immigrant detention centers, that provides transportation for immigrants who are being deported from the US to Mexico and thus colluding with the repressive immigration legislation. And you might know that there have been more immigrants deported during the Obama administration than ever before. G4S also deports people in Israel, and deports people in the UK to Africa, to Angola, for example. And there was the case of Jimmy Mubanga, who died a terrifying death while being restrained by G4S guards in his airplane seat. They belted and handcuffed him behind his back. And because he was talking, um, they used what they call the karaoke hole. And, it's like a weird name, karaoke hole. They push the head of the prisoner into the um, seat in front of him. This was on a British Airlines plane. And they held him there for something like 40 minutes. And this took place in front of the passengers, in front of the crew, and no one intervened. By the time the ambulance service arrived, he was dead. Of course, um, I was also planning to uh, mention that, uh, that um, uh, Ademir and BDS has called for, uh, called upon the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to divest its 120, is it 120 million? 170 million stake in G4S. Uh, now, this egregious treatment of undocumented immigrants uh, from the US to the UK compels us, I think, to make connections with Palestinians who are transformed into immigrants, indeed undocumented immigrants on their own ancestral land. Companies like G4S provide the technical means of carrying out uh, this uh, process. When, when I visited uh, Palestine in 2011, our delegation met with many organizations, political organizations, academic uh, groups, universities, uh, women's organizations, uh, BDS, and those were absolutely amazing meetings. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, when Omar Barghouti said to us, we're not asking you to do anything extraordinary. We're not asking you to do anything heroic. We are simply asking you not to be complicit with the crimes of the state of Israel. That's the very least we can do. We also had a very interesting meeting with queers for BDS. And some of us joined the panel that Queers for BDS organized at the World Social Forum Justice for Palestine in, in Brazil uh, last year. And of course, um, you're familiar with pinkwashing, right? And um, the attempt 
to represent the state of Israel as the most democratic state of the region, drawing on its connection with the US, but also using strategies of pinkwashing to bolter this, um, this, this, this um, false notion of democracy. Israel is supposed to be the best place for women and for LGBTQ communities. But of course, we have to ask, which women? Um, there's, again, this um, uh, universal category that, 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 that hides uh, 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 racism within it. And we have to ask, which LGBTQ communities? Certainly not Palestinian. The paintwashing effect uh, covers over the carceral repression. And the, the work that Queers for BDM, BDS have done uh, has pointed out the extent to which justice is invisible. You cannot say that you want justice for LGBTQ communities and at the same time subject Palestinians to the kind of absolute repression that is associated with the occupation of Palestine. So my time is just about up. I just want to say before I end that um, when, when I described the segregation in Palestine that so clearly mirrors the historical apartheid racism in the US, uh, and when I've spoken to black audiences, uh, the response has almost inevitably been, why has no one told us this before? Why don't we know this? You know, why don't we know about the, the signs on, on, on the highways uh, leading from you know, one settler community to another? Why don't we know about the signs in Hebron uh, that uh, prevent Palestinians from walking down certain streets. Just as we say never again with respect to the fascism that uh, produced the Holocaust, we also need to say never again with respect to apartheid in South Africa. Of course, never again to apartheid in South Africa and in the southern US, but this also means first and foremost that we have to expand and deepen our solidarities with the people of Palestine who are, are experiencing the, 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 the technologies and the practices and the regimes of apartheid uh, inside occupied Palestine. And so we say to the people of Palestine, people of all genders, sexualities, people inside and outside prison walls, people inside and outside the wall, we say free all Palestinian political prisoners, abolish the prison industrial complex, justice for Palestine, and yes, Palestine will be free. Thank you. So I'm going to read out the cards that audience members have written, and I'm actually going to read them as, as they are on, appear on the cards themselves. So the first one says, thank you endlessly. Nura, can you speak on the misrepresentation of the peace accords 
in the US media and among Americans. Oslo Accords, Camp David, and so on. Oh, like in just two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have, can I write a card? Because I have a question for Ms. Davis as well, but I'll, I'll use that privilege later. Let me answer the question. So the peace process has been presented as the only solution, that we have to have a political solution to this condition. And it's true, I agree we have to have a political solution, but the problem is that, that you cannot negotiate when Palestinians have absolutely no political leverage, right? You have the, um, the most powerful state in the Middle East, the fourth largest nuclear power in the world, Right? Israel has been a state since 1948. Visa, uh, with the Palestinians who are stateless, dispersed, without any kind of military capability, zero negotiating leverage, who are dependent on international donor aid, primary amongst them is the United States, for mere survival. And so what the peace process has done since 1993 has created a false sense of parity between two sides, which aren't two sides. It's a state and a stateless people. It's an oppressor and an oppressed population. It's an occupier and an occupied. But created a sense of false parity using suits and tables, uh, mostly men, of course, who have, ha have been subject to endless negotiations with absolutely no dependable terms of reference. The, de the Declaration of Principles, which basically established the Oslo Accords in 1993, is an agreement to agree. There are no principles in it. There is no reference to international law. In fact, 59% of the East Jerusalem settlements according to the Oslo Accords, are legal. So when Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu says, these aren't settlements, these are Jewish neighborhoods, he's actually right, according to the Oslo Accords. But according to international law, their contravention of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, contravention of Article 8 of the Rome Statute, and therefore war crimes, right? They can go to the ICC for this, for the International Criminal Court, and yet, under Oslo, this is all perfectly legal. Even the disparate access to water is enshrined in the Oslo Accords under Article 40, as opposed to being uh, according to international law, which would distribute water 50-50. Instead, the main access, uh, the main water source for Palestinian, which is the Western Aquifer in the West Bank, 60% of it runs through the West Bank, Israel derives 80% of its yield for its population, for its settler population, leaving 20% for the rest of the Palestinian population. And under Oslo, that's legal. OK, so why would Palestinians be engaged in this then for two decades now, over two decades? We're in 2014, we're 21 years. Why do Palestinians stay? Well, because the US has provided the Palestinians with its only means of survival. Today, 40% of the Palestinian population is dependent on that international donor aid for survival. As a result of uh, Fayyadism, since 2007 to 2009, they've also introduced neoliberal models in the West Bank. And now Palestinians are not only under occupation, dependent on a bloated public sector, but are also heavily in debt because of new credit lines that were introduced. So the only way to shake out of the peace process would be to shake off the US. And Palestinians can do it, and Palestine has done it. The Palestinian leadership, which by the way is defunct and illegitimate, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas is not president. He's over. Uh, his, his presidential mandate ended in 2009. He extended it by presidential decree to 2010. Since 2010, he's led without a mandate. But the US wants him there, so he stays. And he's treated as a president the world over. But when, they, when this leadership wanted to, it did resist twice so far, and not adequately. 
Once, in 2012, at the UN General Assembly, when it pushed ahead for recognition for an upgrade in status to a non-member, uh, non-voting member state of the United Nations, and last week, when it signed 15 international agreements in the face of a crumbling peace process. But to seriously get out of this, one, Palestinians need to shake off Oslo, they also need to get rid of a very uh, illegitimate and corrupt Palestinian authority, and that means also getting rid of the U.S. and finding alternatives, and one of the best alternatives, I would say, is in a new uh, international alliance between uh, Britain, Russia, India, and China, although, of course, now with our new geopolitical concerns in Ukraine uh, and the tensions between Russia and the U.S., this has become even more untenable. The next two questions are related, so I'll, I'll read both of them, and then both can decide how you want to respond. Um, so the first one is actually addressed directly to Angela. What is the place of feminism in the struggle for prisoners from Palestine to the US? And both Noura and Angela, what advice do you have for the generation of young women dedicated to resistance, liberty, and justice? Struggle for prisoners from Palestine to the U.S. Um, well, that might be the beginning of a very long conversation. <laughs> huh? uh, so, uh, let me say that um, um, oftentimes we think of feminism as this very um, narrow concern. Uh, uh, and certainly this is how I once thought of feminism. Uh, I assumed that uh, it was largely about the advance of uh, women who had already uh, uh, reached uh, the top of the hierarchy but simply couldn't penetrate the glass ceiling. Uh, and certainly there are those who call themselves feminists who are only trying to uh, participate in the uh, leadership of a process that is exploitative and, 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 and repressive. Uh, but that is not the feminism I uh, associate myself with. Uh, there are multiple feminisms. The kind of feminism that uh, I think is helpful in uh, developing an approach that uh, links mass incarceration in Palestine and, and, and the U.S. Uh, is um, first of all, it's an anti-racist and anti-imperialist, uh, anti-settler colonial uh, uh, feminism. And second of all, second of all, it's um, it's an approach. It's a methodology. Uh, it's it's not it, it's it's yes concerned with gender, but not only with gender. It's concerned with women, but not only with women. For me, feminism represents uh, uh, a method of, of representing intersectionalities, and not only intersectionalities with respect to identities, but intersectionalities with respect to issues and struggles. And so, therefore, the attempt to make the connections between mass incarceration in Palestine and mass incarceration in the U.S. Uh, is a feminist uh, uh, um, uh, approach, uh, um, <laughs> connecting, connecting things that often appear on their face to be separate and unrelated but also oftentimes disarticulating things that are held so closely together that we can't see the possibility of thinking uh, of them uh, uh, separately. And I, I, if that's the, for that example, I like to use the whole notion of crime and punishment. You know, crime and punishment. Well, punishment is about a great deal more than crime. And the assumption is that it's the 
it's a consequence. There's a causal relationship. So it's a consequence of, of crime. But punishment is related to political repression, as we see. Punishment is very much related to class exploitation. It's related to racism. It's related to uh, when one considers that uh, in, in the US, um, trans people are much more likely to be arrested and imprisoned than any other group uh, of people in the society. So what we do is we re-articulate uh, 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 punishment with all of these other issues. Uh, and um, to me, that's what feminism helps us to do. So the second and related question was, what advice do you have for the generation of young women dedicated to resistance, liberty, and justice? Well, you can answer that. You can talk to your peers. <laughs> oh, man. I, that's a compliment. Thank you. I was just thinking, dang, I'm, I'm you know, no longer in that category, so I appreciate that. This is, so, when I heard Well, youth is always relative. OK, I'm going to be on forever. Um, so I, I was, when I first heard that question, I heard, what's the advice to young feminists? And I was thinking the same way that you were, that that meant young men and women, right? Because our men are feminists, obviously, because they're part of the struggle for leading in our liberation, it's a collective struggle. So let me, the, and I had a few things I wanted to say. Number one, um, my advice is, in all the work that we do, in all the work that we do, that we need to center and resist rape culture. With, right? So this idea of victim blaming constantly for victim blaming, especially victim blaming women for the, the gendered violence that they endure, but victim blaming in general, that we never really hold perpetrators to account. And in the process, we end up exculpating all of our social ills. This is our fault. We've done this collectively. So in our work to center that. The second is to also resist this desire to wait for the next male messiah to come lead us into the promised land. I cannot tell you. As a young organizer at Berkeley, I remember that I wrote a memo on gender to my peers and students for justice in Palestine when we launched divestment in 2001. Um, February 6, 2001, when Ariel Sharon was elected for the second time. Um, and I wrote a gender memo to my peers in the group on, on how we should better organize, because we weren't treating one another right. There was too much of, of, of this difference. There was too much of bathroom dealings when boys were just hanging out and girls weren't invited, so to speak. And I got accused of plagiarizing the memo. So. This is, this, is a, this is in our group, and it reminds me of, of what I've read. How can you all call her Anta? I can't help but say Ms. Davis. Oh, you can call her. <laughs> can I say Ms. Davis? Davis, please. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Uh, <laughs> things that I've read her write about you write about not creating hierarchies of oppression, that we don't, for example, shake off the yoke of colonialism in a national struggle and then deal with the patriarchy that afflicts us, but that because of these intersectionalities, that patriarchy and nationalism and other forms of oppression are so interlinked that it, it behooves us not to be struggling for that liberation in tandem. And we do that in the ways that we organize ourselves and not just for the world that we want to create. And so then the last thing I'll say to young men and women is that don't follow models that were created for you before you. These are mostly neoliberal models that, that, that encourage acquiescence and that encourage reproduction, as you so eloquently put, the reproduction of the same that we live without challenging it in revolutionary ways. You can pave your own path. It's lonely as you do it. And then everyone will follow. That's my advice.
sit closer to you all. Uh, this one's a long one, so uh, bear with me. Collective liberation, the struggle for liberation for all marginalized people, as explained by Bell Hooks, details the necessity for joint struggle movements among all peoples. How do you see the connections between Palestinian hunger strikes, those at Pelican Bay and the Northwest Detention Center, um, and the possible spark for further movements? What advice would you give to hunger strikers at the Northwest Detention Center? Mm. I don't, I don't know if there's any advice uh, that I would want to give. I would simply want to um, express my solidarity. And uh, when prisoners engage in hunger strike, as, as Nora pointed out in her presentation, they're using the only thing that they have. That is the only way that they can resist. They're using their bodies. And in many ways, they are destroying their bodies in order to make a point, in order to participate in a collective struggle. So those of us who inhabit this space we uh, call the free world, which we all know is not nearly as free as it pretends to be. Uh, but we do have the capacity to generate solidarity. And of course, during the Pelican Bay, well, actually, there's prisoners who are still involved in the hunger strike movement in California, uh, because the issue of solitary confinement has still not been resolved uh, there. And, and to see the possibility of making connections between what is happening in California prisons, what's happening in um, detention, in the detention center in, in the Northwest, uh, in Washington, and what is happening inside um, Israeli uh, prisons to uh, Palestinian prisoners. If we, can, if we can make that connection, if we can encourage other people to uh, think seriously about the links and the intersectionalities. I think that would be uh, the best role that, 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 that we might play. And let me say that all of us who are committed to um, um, Palestine solidarity, we have a special responsibility. We can't keep quiet. And oftentimes, we feel comfortable in situations like this, uh, because we know that we are among friends. Uh, but we, most of the time, we don't feel that comfortable. And we have to learn how to act even as we feel the discomfort of being in spaces that uh, often uh, refer to themselves, represent themselves as progressive spaces, but they're progressive on everything except Israel-Palestine. And so we really have to learn how to speak up uh, and deal with the consequences. You know, sometimes the consequences aren't nearly as bad as we assumed they might be. But I think this is the moment to do that. And, 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 and let me just say that sometimes historical moments um, appear, and then they disappear. And if we don't do the organizing and the work to take advantage of what is possible at a particular historical moment, we may forever uh, lose that opportunity, or at least lose it for a very long time. And I think this is a moment when um, the possibilities uh, for bringing the issue of, of, of Palestine onto the agendas of all kinds of progressive struggles 
And I think that really needs to be our, our, our agenda right now. Uh, let's have meetings like this, yes, but then let's go forth then and, 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 and find a hundred more, a thousand more, a hundred thousand more, a million more who will stand with us when we say justice for Palestine. to give to prisoners and hunger strikers, I salute you. I mean, that's, I agree, full solidarity. Okay, the next one asks, uh, students, faculty, and staff at US universities are beginning to see the increased privatization, neoliberalization of academic institutions. Can you speak to the intersections between this trend and the repression of BDS activism on campuses? How can BDS also contribute to the larger struggle to reimagine a liberatory education in this country? Well, you know, um, I was speaking last night um, at Pacific University about um, the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer. Uh, you know, we have a lot of anniversaries that we they started uh, in they started last year, and they're going to continue. Right, uh, um, 2015 is the sesquicentennial of of the um, 13th Amendment. Right, uh, and then as as I was saying to uh, the crowd last night, and let's not forget that um, 2016 is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party. <laughs> and the Black Panther Party as an organization uh, which uh, you know, spoke out against police um, crimes, it spoke out on behalf of uh, the demand for health and housing, and, and it also called for international solidarities, it was opposed to all Check out the 10-point program. I actually, last night, I, I just read the 10-point program, uh, and people realize, oh my god, these are the issues that we're still struggling for yeah. you know, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can organize uh, the uh, 50th anniversary of the, of, of, of the uh, Black um, Panther Party. Um, uh, What's the question? neoliberalization of an academic institution. So um, the, uh, the reason I raised the um, uh, Freedom Summer first, okay, now it's all coming back to, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not 100%, I'm only about 60% uh, today, so. <laughs> um, but uh, the reason I was actually talking about Freedom Summer was because that was a moment when students all over the country converged on the South. I mean, it was one of the most amazing experiments in the history of this country, one of the most amazing projects. Because people, kids, students, went to Mississippi knowing they were gonna be facing uh, the worst kind of racist violence. Uh, but not only did they go, but they fought for the right to recruit on college campuses at UC Berkeley. And as a result of the fact that the administration kicked the recruiters off the campus and said, no, you cannot uh, recruit UC Berkeley students to go to Mississippi, um, they started a free speech movement. And people like Bettina Aptega, Mario Savio, they created this massive movement that 
call for free speech on college and university campuses all over the country. And, and as a matter of fact, they won, which meant that every campus was supposed to have a free speech area. And I you know, asked now, where is your free, I asked the president of uh, Pacific University, so where is your free speech area on this campus? <laughs> uh, she didn't know, but uh, <laughs> the students who had demonstrated on the campus, they knew where it was, uh, interestingly. Um, so the reason, the reason I say this is because um, one can see how these struggles over the right to struggle can indeed transform the academy. And certainly with the privatization and neoliberalization of, uh, of the, 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 the US academy and the emphasis on um, individualism, possessive individualism, and this is some, this is, we, we need to include this in the advice. Uh, <coughs> part two, to constantly struggle against individualism um, and recognize that there's a difference between individuality and individualism. Yes. We want individuality, but we recognize that the, 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 the lone individual is not the unit of our communities, of our societies. Uh, uh, we find ourselves through our relations with each other, and therefore we have to imagine ourselves first and for foremost as members of communities, of collectives, uh, you know, not as the bourgeois individual, the capitalist individual, the market individual. And this is what neoliberalism has done. It has so destroyed our ability to imagine ourselves in relation to each other that we, we, we think of ourselves as uh, you know, abstract uh, uh, um, merchants on the market, you know, trying to buy and sell. So we even start to think of ourselves as commodities or our education as commodities. And we talk about how we're marketing ourselves. And, uh, so, you know, that's very dangerous language that we often just pick up and, um, and use because it's available. Um, so, yeah, and I think the, um, the effort to repress um, B BDS activism and justice for Palestine, students for justice for Palestine are doing such important work on campuses all over the country. And the very fact that the that is Israeli anti-apartheid week has spread uh, in a relatively short period of time uh, is an indication of, I think, the changes that are, are possible. So sorry for... Um, speaking so long. Um. Can, I, can I ask you that? So um, I think this is a critical, critical question because the university campus is dramatically changing. I mean, it was definitely different in Martin Savio's time and in, in, in the free speech movement, certainly in my time and even now. But not only is the university promoting the cults of the individual, right? So how are you going to brand yourself? How are you going to monetize your time? How are you going to become the it? Which is, you know, this is the trend that we're seeing. Um, there's, there's a higher opportunity cost for students to even take risks because of the cost of education. And so now you're entering into school, and it's a high risk to even consider, for example, going to school and pursuing graduate studies because of the loans that one is gonna graduate with, without the guarantee of opportunity, and certainly no loan forgiveness. I mean, the university, like the medical industry, like all these things that are supposed to provide services in health and education and community, have become industries that are for-profit models. And so students that once entered and had the least to lose because they don't have them necessarily Right? If they're, this is, we're talking about freshmen 18 years old, they don't necessarily have families 
and they don't necessarily have people to take care of, and they don't necessarily have nine to five jobs, and can therefore be imaginative and take these risks and envision and push the rest of society outwards beyond where it's comfortable because they're not in their, their rigid modes. Now these students have more to lose. The risks are so high. The UC Irvine students who protested Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren were suspended and they were criminally prosecuted for their protest. How high is that risk knowing that they can graduate, they can be expelled with those debts and not be able to pay them back? <coughs> now on campus, especially with BDS, these risks are incredibly high because of the way that universities are also responsive to donors and to alumni. And I say this in my experience at Berkeley, where as a result of a FOIA request, we discovered, I got to see my file, right, that letters were written about me if I, for example, wasn't settled, tamed, controlled, whatever, that donors would, donors threatened to rescind their funding. So you have universities that are also responding to this, and most recently at uh, Northeastern, the SJP was banned on campus. I mean, talk about a restriction of free speech. Two women of color were the only two prosecuted on campus and a threat of suspension, and they're basically used as a model for the rest of the nation. And so BDS is a great risk because especially on, on campuses and for students, because they're doing such a great job. Six UCs to pass divestment resolutions in the past two years. Oh my god, that's incredible. And without any funding, decentralized leadership, we're talking about the one place where you are literally finding organic leaders come up and rise, right? Where they're not getting awards for what they do and accolades and buttons and pins for being amazing and being honored by the Obama administration or whatnot. They're just doing it because it's right. And so I say to the BDS activists, you're taking this risk, but you're not the first ones to do that. And know that the reward is high because you are norm changers. When you do it, others are inspired to do it, not only on the question of Palestine, but on other questions from labor on campus to racial equality to, to, to issues um, that affect broader society. And so you have to keep on keeping and, and know that that's the risk that, that you'll be rewarded for. History will reward you for that. addressed to both of you. Can you each comment on how you define and stay healthy and not get overwhelmed or incapacitated? <laughs> and not get overwhelmed or inca incapacitated by the horror and challenge of confronting injustice? And what brings you joy? Um, so I, I, I want, I'm only going first because I would love to have Dr. Davis have the closing word. Um, so I think that's funny, whoever asked that question, I think that's really funny. Um, because one, and especially for women of color, I think, um, have been seriously afflicted with chronic disease and have not survived the, you know, structural violence and then the personal violence that one embodies. I think for me, I mean, if anybody heard me answering this question that really knows me, they, you know, pull me off the stage, because I've been told several times when you're sick, you got to stay still, stop moving, da 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 um, When you're motivated, you, something else moves you, right? And partly the sickness is also, is also sweating out that residue and the things that we carry inside. And so, I, I don't know, for me, the way that I try to stay healthy, though, and happy, is learning that I, I fight, I fight for justice, not from a place of guilt, which I used to fight for it from, 
I used to feel guilty all the time because I wasn't born somewhere else um, under some other regime, living under some other conditions, and only fortune placed me where it did, right? And I learned to fight for justice from a place of love because I knew that that was much healthier. So that was my most revolutionary revelation. And so, it, you know, the, the, the love that I had for the world, I started to love myself for it too. And take the time out to, for example, uh, build friends outside of the movement. <gasps> oh my God! <laughs> Who know nothing about this and just enjoy people because that's, that's what you enjoy, people. And then, and I'll, I'll share something that we, we haven't actually made public yet, but something that I've learned to derive joy from is family. And I come here as a new mama and learning to be safe It's kind of ironic that I have to um, speak about the, this issue uh, in my current state. Uh, uh, but I can tell you that normally I do take care of myself. And this is only something that I came to um, recognize the importance of doing after many, many years of running myself into the ground, of sleeping three hours a night, and, and um, it's just that I was, last week I did spend <laughs> two days where I only got three hours of sleep, <laughs> and then I got this terrible cold. Uh, um, but normally, normally this doesn't happen. Uh, and I do take seriously the importance of incorporating self-care into our um, commitment to struggle. Um, if we don't take care of ourselves, uh, uh, how can we? How can we even model what it is we're trying to struggle for? So, so I really. I mean, this is, this is something that I, I like to talk about, uh, because I like to talk about um, um, caring for the body, but also uh, caring for the spirit. And, um, you know, I, I'm a person who does a lot of exercise. I do, you know, I have, I, I have a whole long um, history of all of the physical things that I've done that would take too long to share with you. So, you know, I can say that I'm a person who um, does yoga and I meditate. And I also am attentive to my eating practices. Uh, and I think that um, as, as someone, I, I celebrated my 70th birthday um, in January. Except I have to turn this off so I can. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, this is something that we have to encourage. Because otherwise, what happens is that people get involved for a minute. And then they get burnt out. And then they drop it. And for me, it's, it's, it's not about um, figuring out how to accomplish this immediate goal. It's about how to craft a lifetime of struggle. And so therefore, when you become involved, you have to figure out <coughs> how, to, um, how to maintain your passion. So it means that that you've got to be able to find joy in the movement as well. And yeah, you can 
search for it outside, but the, the work itself has to be able to bring you pleasure. Um, and so it means that it's not all about um, you know, these serious activists who do nothing except uh, print leaflets out and distribute them and they sit in meetings for half the night and, and people who can be really boring, you know? <laughs> and, you know, like, like, like Emma Goldman said, uh, if I can't dance, you know, I don't want your revolution. <laughs> Thank you very much.